the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your mostly bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal. I'm your host, John Ross, joined today by IJ attorney Robert Everett Johnson, as well as special guest, Professor Evan Burnick. Evan is a visiting lecturer at Georgetown Law and also a founding member of this podcast. Evan, glad to have you back. Glad to be here. Brings back a lot of memories. Today's show will be an administrative law extravaganza. We'll start things off in the D.C. Circuit. Evan. So uh, the case name is Association of American Railroads versus the United States Department of Transportation, and it involves Amtrak, a for-profit, government-created entity that gets preference over rate transportation and using rail lines pursuant to congressional statute enacted in in the 1970s. Uh, More recently, specifically in 2008, Amtrak got a lot more power. Uh, Congress empowered it to act with the Department of Transportation to promulgate metrics and standards uh, that facilitated priority access by Amtrak to passenger rail lines. Uh, and because Amtrak actually competes with uh, sca- uh, competes for scarce rail space uh, with freight transportation as well, this proved very controversial. And in 2010, when Amtrak, working together with the Department of Transportation, promulgated a rule that a group of railroad uh, companies that haul freight found objectionable, they brought a constitutional challenge to the entire arrangement, as well as the rule. Uh, This case was actually litigated all the way to the Supreme Court. There were three constitutional claims we need to keep track of. The first First is that Congress had unconstitutionally delegated essentially legislative power to a private entity that isn't the government. That's the only non-delegation doctrine really really which has any life in our law anymore. Uh, The second is that it violated due process of law to empower this self-interested entity, Amtrak, to effectively regulate its competitors. And the third constitutional claim took place under the Appointments Clause, and it was an objection to the fact that if Amtrak and the Department of Transportation can't agree on standards and metrics, the case has to be submitted to arbitration by an independent body. And if that body makes a decision, that's just the way things go. And it's argued that that violated the Appointments Clause. You can't delegate that kind of power to an independent body that is removed through several uh, degrees of separation from the appointments process. Um, Supreme Court's held that Amtrak is actually a government entity, and basically that dooms the non-delegation challenge. But the D.C. Circuit then came back and held that even if it's not a delegation of power that violates the Constitution, it still violates due process to have this self-interested entity regulating its competitors, and the arbitration arrangement still violates the Appointments Clause. And the D.C. Circuit sent it back down to the district court to provide a remedy. What was that remedy? Well, that's what this case is all about. Rob Everett Johnson, what was the remedy? So the district court basically gets this case from uh, the Court of Appeals and says, my hands are tied. Um, there's this mandate saying that um, you know, the, the Court of Appeals has said very clearly that this rulemaking process where Amtrak is making rules together with the Department of Transportation yeah. violates due process. And so it said, my hands are tied. That's what the mandate says, and that's... Um, that's the way it is. And so they just struck down that entire process. Now, the government then comes up with this very clever theory where they say, well, the problem wasn't actually just that it wasn't the, that Amtrak was making rules together with the Department of Transportation. It was that Amtrak could actually make rules in effect without the Department of Transportation, because what Amtrak could do is it could refuse to agree with the Department of Transportation And then it would go before this arbitrator. And so Evan mentioned the arbitrator a bit earlier uh, in the context of the Appointments Clause claim. And so what the government is essentially trying to do is say, okay, fine, we lose on the Appointments Clause claim. We also lost on this due process claim, but maybe we can just kind of like make them the same so that we only lose on the arbitration claim. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's a little crazy because that's not what the panel said. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, uh, and the district court said, you know, I can't do that because that's not what the panel said, but then it goes back up to the D.C. Circuit, where conveniently it gets a new panel with three different judges. And lo and behold, suddenly the government is able to prevail on this new and wacky interpretation of what the previous panel had done. 
And it is wacky. I would encourage listeners to actually go back and read the original panel opinion to see why it is wacky. Um, it is clear that the due process part of the original panel opinion is exclusively concerns with self-interested regulation. And the problem with the with uh, this arrangement is not that it gets submitted to an arbitrator that the court actually described as a check on self-interested regulation at one point. It is that you have a self-interested entity formulating, making these rules in the first instance, an entity that is actually part of or at least within a department within the executive branch, and that we have no reason to believe is going to be constantly at loggerheads with a fellow executive branch entity. Yeah, and so I mean, what the what the panel, the new panel, uh, is essentially trying to do is saying, well, the problem is not that Amtrak is participating in this regulatory process, mm-hmm. um, and they kind of almost make it sound like you know anybody can participate in a regulatory process. Mm-hmm. Uh, if an agency is promulgating a rule, they put out a request for comments, and anybody can submit a mm-hmm. comment. So industry participates all the time, and they minimize the significance of that and say the the problem is that Amtrak could actually essentially make its make rules itself because it could disagree with the Department of Transportation and then mm-hmm. if the arbitrator sided with it that would then it, that would become the rule right mm-hmm. um, what's weird about it though is that Amtrak is not just participating in the sense that like, you or I would participate if we submitted a comment letter mm-hmm. the way it actually works is in order for there to be a rule and even after this decision like mm-hmm. the remedy that the panel is adopting is it, in order for there to be a rule two people have to agree or two agencies have to agree Amtrak has to agree and the Department of Transportation has to agree. And so, yes, they, the point the panel is making is, well, the Department of Transportation acts as a check on Amtrak, so that Am- Amtrak can't abuse its power because the Department of Transportation has to agree. But at the same time, Amtrak is still acting as a check on the Department of Transportation in the same way, right? The Department of Transportation can't make rules mm-hmm. unless Amtrak agrees. Right. And, of course, the, the whole problem here is that Amtrak is a for-profit entity and giving one for-profit entity essentially rule-making uh, veto power over the regulatory rules to govern its competitors is a huge problem and not just like normal participation in the administrative process. Right. And you can find all of this in Judge Tattel's uh, dissenting opinion, uh, which basically says the district court faithfully followed the original panel opinion. And though he doesn't quite say this, he certainly implies it. The current panel is not faithfully following the original panel opinion. It is carving out a distinction that the original panel opinion did not draw. And it's effectively going to leave everybody worse off because in in the context of the initial rule, uh, the, 22, uh, the 2010 metrics and standards, there wasn't even arbitration to begin with. There's no reason to think that the people who challenge this, uh, who challenge this arrangement, are going to be satisfied with the fact that the same arrangements that enabled uh, uh, Amtrak working together with the Department of Transportation to promulgate this odious rule, this self-interested rule in the first instance, is now going to be changed. There's now only not going to be an independent check on their ability to collaborate in ways that these groups found offensive to begin with. So it's a a cluster blank. Well, so the rule in question has been repealed, though. That's right. Yes. But they could promulgate another rule again that would be equally objectionable, and now you wouldn't have an independent arbitrator to check it. I think maybe this becomes simpler if you just look at this from the perspective of the freight railways, right? And the freight railways are saying is, look, we compete with Amtrak for this scarce resource, the the rail lines, right? That they in fact own. It's the freight rails uh, that that's their own railways that Amtrak yeah, is right. essentially forcing them to give up. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so the freight rails are saying, look, it's just not fair to allow Amtrak to decide these questions of regulation. And the solution now is, well, Amtrak's going to decide it together with the Department of Transportation. Right. Amtrak is still ultimately has a Right. They have control over what these regulations say because if they don't agree with the Department of Transportation, nothing's going to happen. So the Department of Transportation has to reach an agreement with Amtrak mm-hmm. in order for there to be a rule passed. And that right. that's exactly the same problem that there was before. Right. And the other thing that's worth mentioning is that the original panel opinion relied heavily on a 1935 decision called uh, Carter Cole, which involved an arrangement whereby you had a statute that empowered two-thirds of the large coal producers in the country to effectively prevent the governments from contracting with any group that did not apply 
um, the standards and metrics that they formulated. Um, there was no independent arbitrator. The problem that the court had with this arrangement was that you had self-interested regulation that was backed by the government, and that was a problem. Um, the idea that the arbitration would have solved that problem, the availability of an independent arbitrator in that case would have cured the constitutional defect, um, is just as implausible as the idea that the panel opinion rested upon that distinction in this case. So that's a 1935 case. Is there anything more recent, or are we are we going all the way back to the New we, Deal? Uh, we're going all the way back to the New Deal. I mean, the original panel opinion was written by Judge Janice Rogers Brown. Um, she has what I would describe as as reasonable and sometimes even persuasive, but definitely outlier views about the constitutional status of the administrative state more generally and the life of Carter Cole, probably in particular. That said, Carter Cole has not been repudiated. The non-delegation doctrine to to private actors thing has never been repudiated in the same way that the non-delegation doctrine to administrative agencies had. So it's it's a respectful, respectable point of view. And the fact that she's reaching all the way back to it can only reflect that it's a foundational case and the court hasn't revisited it. Okay. Well, perhaps we'll be hearing more about this case on Bonker before SCOTUS once again. Yes. Uh, so let's move on to the Fifth Circuit now, Rob. All right, so this is a uh, fascinating separation of powers case out of the Fifth Circuit. Um, it's a case that arises out of the uh, 2008 financial crisis. And so taking ourselves back in time, the economy is absolutely in tatters. The financial markets are in an uproar. And Congress, together with President Bush, um, decided to uh, enact this statute to try to stop everything and to make it all better. And the statute is called the Housing and Economic Recovery Act. And it creates this agency called the Federal Housing Finance Agency. And the purpose of this agency, the FHFA, is to oversee uh, two entities that you may have heard of, uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And these are agencies that essentially um, provide government backing for um, uh, mortgages, and so they are they're lenders, right? And so they they had a role in the financial crisis because they were issuing loans to people um, who perhaps should not have gotten loans and were not really able to pay them off. And so some people um, have said that Fannie and Freddie are bear some level of responsibility for the financial crisis. Um, in addition, Fannie and Freddie were in an extremely perilous uh, financial um, circumstance after the crisis because they held all of these loans and they, um, you know, people weren't paying on them. And so Fannie and Freddie were in danger of going under. Um, what the FHFA then does is they put Fannie and Freddie into what is called a conservatorship. Uh, a conservatorship means they're basically trying to take these two entities under government control to keep them, um, keep them alive. And this becomes relevant later. The statute provides for two things. It provides for what's called a receivership and a conservatorship. Um, and the purpose of a receivership uh, is to wind down an entity. It's to take it and to basically wrap it up. The purpose of a conservatorship is more like what it sounds like. It's to conserve the entity. And so the FHFA creates what is called a conservatorship. Um, and for a while, they're trying to preserve, conserve Fannie and Freddie. But um, at some point, they decide, actually, we want to wind them up. And so they enact what is called um, that what they call their net sweep rule. And what the net, net sweep rule does is it essentially says any money that Fannie and Freddie make um, in any you know period of time uh, is going to be transferred from Fannie and Freddie and given to the U.S. Treasury. And so it's a little more complicated than that, but basically what's going on is Fannie and Freddie are allowed to keep operating, mm -hmm. but any money that they make is being transferred to the U.S. government. It's a huge... Um, money grab, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it means that Fannie and Freddie are eventually going to be wound down. Um, there are people who are shareholders to Fannie and Freddie who don't like this, and they sue to challenge the agency. Mm -hmm. And they bring a, a, a series of different challenges. There's a threshold question of whether the underlying statute actually authorizes the FHFA to do this. 
in its role as a conservator. Uh, it seems inconsistent with the role of a conservator to wind down an entity that is something that receivers, at least if you rely upon the conventional common law understandings of the terms, um, generally do. That said, this is a statute that delegates a heck of a lot of power. It uses the words conservator and receiver interchangeably at a lot of points. So there's a reasonable argument that you can rework what the agency did in a way that's consistent with the statute. Yeah, and in fact, m many circuits have held that, right? And so all of them except for, well, Judge Willett disagrees, and he's got a lot to say about that, and we can get into that. Uh, but beyond the statutory claim, there are also constitutional claims that are lurking. And the, specifically, the constitutional claim is that this agency is headed by a single director who is removable only for cause, not at the will of the president, and having an independent, having a director who wields this kind of power, it's incredible power, um, over these entities, uh, removable only for cause and insulated against presidential control um, violates the separation of powers. Yeah, and actually that's not the only way that he's insulated. The other sort of key fact about this agency is it's not funded through the normal appropriations process. Right. Instead, it's funded through, I think, um, fees essentially that are imposed right. on these regulated entities. Right. And so they're getting mm -hmm. um, all the money to fund their budget is coming sort of automatically under the statute rather than having to be appropriated um, through the normal appropriations process, which, you know, obviously the power of the purse is one of the huge checks on agency action, and that's entirely taken away. So the obstacle, or the doctrinal obstacle to reaching the conclusion that this is a problem from a separation of powers perspective, and the panel ultimately, or the, the court ultimately concludes that it is a problem, is that the Supreme Court has upheld for cause restrictions on the removal of the heads of independent agencies. Um, in Humphrey's executor, uh, the court said that arrangement, however out of step it might be with the founder's expectations with respect to the, how the Constitution sets up governments, is nonetheless something that is constitutionally sound. So this court needs to make a series of intermediate distinctions to avoid the force of Hum Humphrey's executor. And Rob has mentioned one. Um, the president's ability to veto an appropriation for an agency is a powerful means of asserting control over its activities. Um, that's absent here. I've mentioned another indirectly. It's headed by a single director rather than multiple members um, who may be of different parties. Um, because the ability of the president to influence members of his party on a multi-member board can effectuate control over agencies' activities, that's a powerful check, or can be a powerful check. That's also absent here. Finally, at least in the context of a couple of different independent agencies with single directors, um, like the CFPB, the Finan uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, in that case, you had the ability of a independent board that was um, composed of a couple of other heads of independent agencies and members of the president's cabinets that were able to assert control over the agency's activities. That's also absence. So the court ultimately comes to the conclusion that while independent agencies are okay and for cause protections for the heads of even single member independent agencies might be okay, this is a bridge too far. And it violates the Constitution in the specific sense of violating the Take Care Clause, which provides that the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. The president can't ensure faithful execution, the idea of this opinion is, if people who are executing the laws are sufficiently removed from his control. It's not exactly very precise about how much control there must be, um, but the Constitution really doesn't specify how much power there must be. So what you see is the uh, court pragmatically grappling with constitutional values and a particular in the context of a particular institutional arrangement, and I think doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I mean, of course, you, the other way of looking at it would be, well, the Constitution doesn't imagine any of this stuff. And so, yes. you know, the Constitution imagines an executive branch that is actually controlled by the executive. And the whole idea of independent agencies is kind of nowhere to be found in the Constitution. So, you know, yes, they're doing their best um, with a administrative structure that is already very far removed from what the Constitution mm -hmm. really imagined. And they have a very interesting approach. I think the way I would think about it is, you know, they're rather than trying to say there's a, that there's a hard line rule about when um, these sorts of arrangements violate the Constitution and when they don't, what they essentially suggest is, look, Congress has a menu of options. 
that they can use to insulate agencies from the executive. Um, you know, one of them is restrictions on removal. One of them is, um, you know, single director versus multiple director. One of them is the appropriations issue. And then, you know, there's the oversight committee issue that Evan mentioned. And so Congress can choose from all of these menus of options. And the problem here is that um, essentially Congress has chosen not just a couple things from the menu, but they've chosen the whole menu. And you can't order the whole menu. That's basically what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, it's it's. I think it's a good it's a good decision. It's um, it's interesting because it really I think they distinguish a recent decision from the D.C. Circuit um, that upholds um, a similarly structured agency that also came out of the financial crisis, the Consumer Financial mm -hmm. Protection Bureau, uh, and they distinguish that, but on grounds that I'm not sure are that compelling. So I, I think there's a very good chance that. Um, these issues are headed up to the Supreme Court, and that um, ultimately uh, this agency and the CFPB may rise or fall together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what they say is, well, the CFPB is different because it is subject to oversight mm -hmm. by a um, you know committee that is composed that is in, that is itself accountable to the president, and that this committee mm -hmm. can veto actions of the CFPB, um, whereas the uh, F HFA is overseen by a committee, but that committee can only make recommendations and participate in the rulemaking and regulatory process. It can't veto actions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure that that distinction between these two agencies is so compelling that it makes sense to treat them differently. Right. And as the dissent actually points out, there are other agencies that also are overseen by committees that only have the ability to recommend solutions. So if you don't want to hold that the Social Security Administration's uh, process for uh, or the restrictions on for-cause removal for the head of the Social Security Administration is unconstitutional, which the court probably doesn't want to do, um, then you probably have to come up with a better distinction. Um, I mean, this is, this is hard stuff. And dealing with um, the existence of Humphrey's executor as a barrier to the conclusion that you just can't have four cause restrictions on the removal of the heads of these independent agencies is a tough thing for the courts to grapple with. Um, but this is a uh, this is a very well structured uh, struct uh, functionalist opinion that tries to make the best of what, in the estimation of the court, is probably a suboptimal uh, doctrine that is inconsistent with the Constitution as a first order matter. But even if you don't believe that, they do a pretty good job of dealing with the with the relevant precedents. One of the interesting things about this case is that it's actually a per curiam decision, and that's one of the sort of yeah. Uh, and it, it's hard to know what happened here, but you know. You sort of read between the lines, and the lineup that you have here is it's a per curiam decision, and the per the per curiam decision actually, um, you know, some people have suggested, and I think this is right, that it, it reads as if it's actually written by two different authors. It reads like the most of the opinion is written in in one style that is, um, I think it's is perfectly lovely style, but it it doesn't um, have it doesn't have I guess pizzazz necessarily, and then there's a, the section on the actual constitutional issues is written with a certain amount of pizzazz. And people have suggested that that might mean that they're written by two different authors. Um, and I think some people have suggested that the section on uh, the constitutional issues reads as if it was written by just by Judge Willett. Now, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the recently appointed uh, Fifth Circuit judge, who people may remember is the uh, former uh, Texas Supreme Court justice who has an active Twitter presence and everybody and loves. an active Twitter presence. And, and is a fantastic writer, as we all know from his decision in Patel, which was an IJ case, um, which if you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, and you should and also so, read a separate opinion in this case, which, in, uh, which yes. actually engages the statutory issues and says that independently of the constitutional defects, uh, the agency exceeded its authority under the statute. If, if I had to read between the lines on this opinion, I would say what happened here is that the chief judge, who ends up dissenting, mm -hmm. um, wrote, this, wrote an opinion saying that uh, the constitutional claims fail and that Judge Willett convinced the other panel member who doesn't write anything to switch his vote. And then the chief judge uh, let Judge Willett essentially use his opinion, but Judge Willett subbed in his new constitutional analysis, um, and then Judge Willett wrote separately on the statutory issue. Mm -hmm. So I, my reading of this is that Judge Willett actually changed the vote and the outcome in this case, but 
total inside baseball, who knows? It sounds plausible to me. Um, and the other thing worth uh, mentioning about this whole thing is what the court ultimately does with the relevant statute. It doesn't say the whole thing is unconstitutional. It just says you can have a single director, but it's got to be he's got to be removable for cause. And I think it's an open question as to whether this as actually isn't the worst of all possible worlds, given that you now have a single individual who is at the who enjoys his power at the will of the president and has all of this discretionary power that is arguably as a first order matter inconsistent with the Constitution. But at least it would provide Congress with an incentive to fix the problem to the extent that there is one. Before we wrap up, let's real briefly talk about the statutory issues that Justice our Judge Willett gets into. Right. So Judge Willett argues that the term conservator um, has a precise legal meaning, uh, it connotes a fiduciary relationship and a requirement that one act in the best interests of shareholders. And he argues that the, con- that the relevant statutes incorporated that common law understanding. And that's inconsistent with the idea that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the FHFA can wind up uh, or wind down, rather, um, Fannie and Freddie's assets. Instead, it needs to preserve them. Um, and the argument against that position is that the the relevant statute actually departs from fiduciary norms in a bunch of different ways more generally. And so maybe we shouldn't attach the common law understanding to conservator that we would ordinarily attach to it. And a number of other courts of appeals have also reached that conclusion. I will say, though, that Judge Willett argues ably for his particular position, um, and I would encourage everybody to actually read it and compare it to the other opinions to see who has the better of that argument. I, I found his opinion very convincing, actually. I, I would not be surprised if this... I think this case has a good chance of going up um, simply because there's a lot of different splits and issues here that are quite important. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if his opinion carries the day. I found it, it very well-reasoned, and it's, it's also just extremely well-written. Um, yes. It's a very, very good piece of judicial work. Mm-hmm. I agree. As a non-lawyer, it seems just very unfair that you as an investor would give money to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and then that would all be wiped out? So the pro- its profits would be wiped out, but you could still get assets through the liquidation of these entities in the final stages. So it's not like these people are completely screwed for the uh, with respect to all of its holdings. Um, it's just that they won't be entitled to any of its profits at this point. It, it and, does. It is very. It does seem very unfair, though, because I mean, part of what's going on here is the government had to bail out Fannie and Freddie, you know, to the tune of a lot of money um, during the financial crisis, mm-hmm. and so all, a lot of this was imposed essentially as a, um, um, you know, in the wake of the bailout to say, well, we got to get our money back. But at this point, the federal government has gotten back more than it gave to Fannie and Freddie, and yet. Fannie and Freddie continue to pay all of this money to the Treasury. Yeah. Um, you know, and at this point, there's no reason to liquidate Fannie and Freddie because they are um, going concerns that are, in fact, generating money that is being given to the federal government. These investors are being wiped out for reasons that are not entirely clear. So looking at this through the agency's lens, and I do this with a little bit of trepidation, um, the original arrangement saw the agency basically giving cash dividends and then liquidation preferences um, to the Treasury. Uh, And with cash dividends and liquidation preferences, um, if you get to a point where the thing is just never going to be profitable and you do eventually have to wind it up, you could get to a point where Treasury gets everything and the shareholders are completely wiped out once the thing has to be wound up. So the argument would be that this thing is never going to be profitable. If it's never going to be profitable, shareholders will be better off if the Treasury doesn't get a ton of liquidation preferences. And therefore, this at least guarantees that they won't be completely wiped out if this thing does ultimately fail to turn a profit. All right, guys, let's move on to the last case. So this case is um, uh, Kisar v. O'Rourke. Um, it involves a combat veteran who, in 1983, saw disability-related benefits, claiming to have suffered from PTSD. His regional officer concluded that he had PTSD-like symptoms, 
Um, but a psychiatrist eventually concluded that no, he didn't have PTSD. Um, he had some behavioral issues, and therefore the VA concluded that he wasn't entitled to any benefits resulting from uh, PTSD. Flash forward about 20 years, he files a motion for a motion, rather. He files a claim asking the VA to reconsider its decision. He gets evaluated by another psychiatrist who concludes that, in fact, he does have PTSD. And the VA agrees with him, but says, look, because we only found out now that you have PTSD, uh, we'll start your benefits now, but you don't get any uh, retroactively. So since 1983, you could have been getting all of these benefits, but you won't actually be getting them. And the real nub of the dispute is a regulation which provides that um, somebody who's denied claims can include relevant service records, um, which attest to a dis uh, which attest to his condition. And if the VA ultimately decides to grant benefits, then you're entitled to them retroactively. So, if these are relevant service records that have been submitted in connection with this this uh, this new effort to get benefits, um, then he gets them retroactively. And the, the the petition doesn't really explain why that regulation exists, but my sense of this, and this is purely my sense, is that the the idea is, um, you know, the VA in, is supposed to be an administrative process that's very fair to the veteran, and the the VA actually has it, sort of an obligation to help the veteran. Mm -hmm in this process. And so the first time around, um, any service records that are relevant and potentially helpful should be should have been brought to the attention mm -hmm. of the VA decision maker mm -hmm. by the VA, right? Because right. the VA has those records right. and is supposed to be putting those in the record, right? right? And so if you can find that there are relevant records that were not put forward the first time around, mm -hmm. then your the entitlement to relief is made retroactive because the agency essentially didn't do its job the first time. Right. And so you're entitled to get those benefits looking backwards. Whereas if you just come forward and say, hey, look, I have some new evidence that I found myself, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, now I want my benefits based on this new evidence, well, then the agency didn't do anything wrong, so you're not getting it retroactively. Right. And what makes this tricky is that the initial psychiatrist who evaluated him was aware that this guy was a combat veteran, was aware that he was under fire, um, and there was no issue as to whether this was the actual person. The identity of this combat veteran was not in dispute. So what the agency later argued uh, successfully before the Court of Federal Claims is that a relevant service record has to be a record that would actually have either supported or been outcome determinative um, in a way that these records were not. Yes, this provides us with new information, the argument goes, and yes, we did ultimately make a different decision, um, but it's not relevant in the sense that had we had it in 1983, we could be sure that we would have reached a different outcome. And the Court of Federal Claims said, Yes, that may not be the best reading of the relevant regulation, but under our deference, and this is really why we're talking about this case, which is a doctrine which requires um, courts to defer to agencies' interpretations that are reasonable of their ambiguous regulations, the agency wins. And now we have a cert petition that calls upon the court to reconsider our deference generally and also um, specifically raises the issue of whether R can be trumped by what are termed substantive canons, including the canon that requires judges to interpret um, uh, statutes or laws related to benefits in a way that's uh, favorable to veterans. Um, so the, the petition is twofold, and um, I think it's likely that the court is going to grant for a whole host of reasons. Rob, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think th this is an issue that they're clearly interested in, although <laughs> there's there's something sort of interesting about this petition, which was submitted in, in June. Uh, yeah. it, it repeatedly points out that Justice Kennedy has expressed his interest in overruling our and is, is very interested in this issue and would yes. love to decide this case. Of course, mm -hmm. Justice Kennedy is retiring. No, <laughs> right, exactly. And this, um, but so R is a very controversial doctrine. It has a couple of notable defenders, but um, the scholarly and judicial criticism of it over the last few years has been withering. It's sometimes defended as an extension of the Chevron doctrine, which says judges defer to agencies' interpretations of statutes. Um, and it's argued that this 
makes sense for the same reasons. If the statute is ambiguous, agencies are probably going to make a choice that is better policy than courts are. Similarly, agencies are more likely to make better choices with respect to ambiguous terms in their own regulations than courts are. Um, but our deference really bugs people in different ways. And really the nub of it is the idea that the agency which writes this regulation, promulgates this regulation, is particularly unlikely to be an impartial inter interpreter of it, where at least in the case of Chevron, you have an agency interpreting Congress's statute. So there's no issue with self-interested regulation in the same sense. Yeah, and there's also, I think, a sense that people have that our, in a way that's different from Chevron, works against this idea of giving people fair notice of what the law means. And what I mean by that is Chevron, one defense you could make of Chevron is, well, if you have an ambiguous statute, it's not clear what the statute means, but you have an agency that has passed a regulation that tells you what it means. So that is, that's good because it gives people notice of what the law is. And they, if they want to know what the law is, they just look at the regulation and people should have a sort of reasonable certainty that that's actually what the law is, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you... With our, the incentive it creates is for agencies to pass ambiguous regulations mm -hmm. and then to explain in guidance letters or other sort of forums um, what those ambiguous regulations mean mm -hmm. um, because it's a lot easier for them to change that and it's a lot easier to, to um, do controversial things in guidance documents than it is through a regulation because regulations can be challenged under the APA, whereas guidance documents are hard to challenge in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And so what this creates is a, is a situation, what our creates, is a situation where the incentive of the agency is to be very unclear and, and, and ambiguous in these regulations that are published in books and put out there for everyone to know, mm -hmm. and then to actually make law in these guidance documents that are hard to find, you know, people don't even know they're there. Um, and so it creates a situation where it's much harder for people to even know what the law is mm -hmm. uh, in the first place, and that's not really what we want. Mm -hmm. And so what ours defenders say in response to that is that there's actually no evidence that agencies deliberately draft vague regulations. In fact, it's actually counter to agencies' incentives in certain respects, insofar as they have concerns that a future administration will interpret that vague regulation in a way that undercuts the policies they're trying to achieve, number one. Number two, they just don't have the time or energy to be concerned about what happens in the long term when they might have a chance to implement this vague regulation because they're concerned about arbitrary and capricious challenges. And if you draft a vague regulation, you are actually more likely to lose as a consequence of it being held arbitrary and capricious. That is the, that is the arguments. Uh, there's actually interesting empirical work that's been done on this recently that suggests that agencies have actually been more clear since R was decided. Um, but it still sticks in the craw of people. And there's an alternative argument as well, is that regardless of what kind of incentives it creates for agencies, judges have a duty to interpret and give effect to their best understanding of the law. And even if it would generate great policy consequences for judges to defer to the agency's reasonable understanding, nonetheless, they have an Article III duty, and they can't abdicate that, even if it would be a really good idea. And this is an argument that's gotten a lot of traction recently, particularly um, in the opinions of Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch. Now, I will say that one of the, the issues that I have making my way through this case is that I actually think that the petitioner's argument on the merits of the interpretation of the regulation is clearly right, and that even under R, he should win. There's a provision of the regulation that specifically includes service records of the kind that the petitioner submitted as relevant service records. Um, so I think that even within R, you can come to the conclusion that the agency is clearly wrong. Um, that said, I, I'm not sure what the court will do. Yeah, that's, that's you know, maybe one reason the court wouldn't take this is if you read the regulation, it seems like the agency is just very clearly yeah. wrong. And actually, I think it's wrong for reasons that they don't even talk about in the petition, which is there's this provision that says that an award uh, is retroactive if it was based all or in part on these, re on these records, which yeah. to me very clearly is saying even if their decision is only in part based on these relevant, these newly relevant records, or these new uh, service records, that that's enough to make it retroactive, which seems to speak directly mm -hmm. to the question in this case. And they don't discuss that anywhere in the petition. And I, I haven't read the response. I doubt the government discusses it because um, they don't want to say that they lose. But you know, if I was a clerk on the court, I might, I might be concerned that there's sort of an easy way to, to resolve this. On the other hand, mm 
you know, what the court can do is they can just address the grounds that the court gave and then remand it. And, you know, one thing that could happen, what the court has been doing, despite the fact that there are, you know, two and perhaps maybe three or four justices on the court right now who are very skeptical about Chevron as a first order matter, they're saying that, well, at least if we're going to have Chevron and if we don't want to bear the cost of overruling it because it will be transitions costs, it will make life hard for agency, their reliance interests, et cetera, we should at least beef up the first step and ensure that we do hard-nosed analysis before we conclude that a statute is ambiguous. One thing that could happen here is that the court could decide not to overrule R, but say, look, that first step needs to be taken carefully. The agency is actually clearly wrong, and reviewing courts shouldn't defer to agencies in cases like that. And that would send a signal that would alleviate some of the concerns about R more generally, domesticate it, if you will. Or it could say, we've just had enough of this, it's distinguishable from Chevron, it creates perverse incentives, and it violates Article 3, let's get rid of it now. What I don't think is going to happen is that they will say, this specific canon that the petitioner is seeking to take advantage of is relevant in our cases. Um, in fact, in R, without revisiting R, because R very specifically says in an opinion written by Justice Scalia that the interpretation of the FLSA... Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, according to which um, claims are resolved in the favor of workers, doesn't apply in the context of regulations that are issued pursuant to that statute. By the same token, you can argue that even if this underlying statute needs to be construed in favor of veterans, this regulation doesn't necessarily have to. And I think that that's, that has to be right if you're going to stick with R. Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's just an appetite on the court to get rid of our, and I think that's where this is headed. The really interesting question here is: Do they write it in a way that implicates Chevron, or do they write it in a way that is um, that preserves Chevron and um, and walls that off as as a, a distinct type of deference? I will say what I would really like to see if we're going to go in the direction of trying to domesticate R with substantive canons: start with the rule of lenity. The hmm. idea is that a, the idea that an ambiguous regulation should not be construed in favor of a criminal defendant is ridiculous, in my opinion, and should be used to ensure that any ambiguous regulation is construed in favor of criminal defendants. If you're going to do that with statutes, you should do that with regulations. Okay, that concludes the show. Thanks for joining us. If you like it, please write a review on iTunes. Until next time, this is John Ross from the Institute for Justice, demanding that you get engaged. Thank you.